Hello lovelies, in this video we are going to be looking at AQA, Combined Science Higher Biology Paper 2 for the 2022 exams. Um, this is a very specific video, if you want the other videos, so the Edexcel videos, the chemistry videos, the paper 1 videos, the physics videos, or if you want a t-shirt, then links are all in the description down below. What I've done with this video is I've taken my other whole topic video and I've moved everything around. So we're going to be looking at the parts that are the major focus, we're going to be looking at the practicals, and we're going to be looking at the other stuff that is in there but is not listed as a major focus. And this video does not include anything that the advanced information has told us is not going to be on the exam. To go with this, there is the workbook which has everything, just like this video, the questions on the major focus, the questions on the practicals, and then the questions on the stuff that's not listed, and doesn't include stuff that we know is not going to be on the exam. Link in the description down below to get all of that stuff, and links for the other exams videos for 2022. Good luck guys, I'm going to be here with you every single step of the way, doing as much stuff as I can to help you. Here we have the male and female endocrine system, the pituitary gland is in the brain, thyroid is in the neck, the adrenal glands are in the kidneys, pancreas is hiding behind the stomach, ovaries are kind of like hip level and testes hang below the penis. The testes produce testosterone which has the effect of growing muscles, making the balls and penis drop and grow larger, increasing the rate of hair growth. Oestrogen is produced in the ovaries that is responsible for the maturation of eggs and the menstrual cycle. The pancreas produces insulin which is important for regulating blood glucose levels. The adrenal glands produce adrenaline which is important for our fight or flight response. The thyroid produces thyroxine which is important in regulating our metabolism. The pituitary gland is very busy, among other things it produces follicle stimulating hormone FSH and luteinizing hormone LH. Control of blood glucose is very complicated. After a meal has been eaten, blood glucose levels start to rise. This is picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas produces insulin, which is sent out into the blood. The insulin in the bloodstream is going to cause body cells to start to remove glucose from the blood. Liver and muscle cells can take the glucose and convert it into glycogen and store it. Removing glucose from the blood will cause blood glucose levels to fall. If blood glucose levels get too low, this is also picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas will start to produce glucagon. The glucose that has previously been stored in muscle and liver cells starts to return to the blood. The most complicated part of this is getting all the names right. The stored form of glucose is glycogen. Glucagon will convert that into glucose. And this returning to the glucose will cause blood glucose levels to rise again. There are two different types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. In type 1 diabetes, the pancreas doesn't work properly. So it doesn't produce the right amount of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, cells start to become insensitive to insulin. Symptoms for both are going to be loss of weight, increased need to wee, being very thirsty, blurry vision, fatigue, so being very sleepy and hunger. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is going to involve insulin injections. Type 2 diabetes, it's going to be controlling diet exercise. One of the reasons periods feel so rubbish is because your hormones are literally all over the place. Starting with follicle stimulating hormone, it rises, peaks, and its job is to make the small egg grow up to a larger egg and then be released. Luteinizing hormone is only active for a very, very short period. Its job is to release the egg. Estrogen builds up until it stimulates luteinizing hormone. Progesterone builds up slowly as it builds up the lining of the uterus. And if there is no egg, uh, if there is no embryo implanted in it, that will decrease and the lining of the uterus will break down. Around one in six people will find themselves in the unfortunate position where they can't have have children naturally. But half this is due to male related reasons and half this is due to female related reasons. As you can see I am one of those people and last year um, 2016 we did IVF and this is my massive bump. 
So the obvious advantages for IVF are you get a baby out of it and if you've been in a situation where you can't have something that you really really want you know it's very very sad and affects your mental health quite a lot. So having a baby is going to be good for people that want to have a baby than mental health. However the disadvantages are you have to take a large large number of drugs for a very very long period of time. Um, These have very nasty side effects as well as the daily injections which leave you horribly bruised there are long-term consequences for these because taking these IVF drugs increases your chance of various different types of cancer. It is very, it's very, very expensive. I had to have it twice. That's twice as expensive. Doesn't always work. There is about a 40% success rate with IVF, with each round of IVF costing a, a minimum £5,000 with a 40% success rate. Here are the large number of drugs that I have to take day by day. It's a very costly, time-consuming, painful process. All the food chains start in the same place with the sun providing energy. And then from this energy, things are going to grow, mainly plants, and they get eaten by other things. Whether it's grass being eaten by cows and then going on to be eaten by us or whether we eat the plants directly or whether the plants hear the corn is being turned into corn syrup which is used in ketchup. Whether we eat them directly or process them, we are a top consumer. Whereas other things like cows are going to be herbivores because they just eat plants. So the direction of the arrow is really important in food chains. The direction of the arrow means eaten by. So for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels, we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air, and the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air, it can be taken up by plants, and this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals and then plants and animals both die. From the organic compounds that are in the dead plants and animals, they can turn into fossil fuels by either, either being buried or being sedimented, or they can just go straight back up into the air by the process of decay. And then lastly, our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing. It is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals, and then being inserted into fossil fuels, which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years and you need to know all of these steps. The water cycle is much more complicated than you think it is going to be. Heat energy from the sun comes down, warms the surface of the water on the earth and this is going to cause the water to evaporate. As the water evaporates it's going to become less dense, it's going to rise up and then it's going to condense when it starts to cool down. This is when we're going to get clouds formed. When the clouds are heavy, when the water has accumulated so much, it is going to start to rain, and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. After it's rained, the water is going to do a number of things. It can go into the mountains where it will sink in or percolate deep into the mountains where it's then going to pick up stuff like irons, salts, which is going to affect the, the taste and the chemistry of the water. This will then come out somewhere as a little stream and go into the river. Some of it's going to go into the soil, moving slowly back towards a river or a lake as through flow. Some of the water will go straight onto the ground. 
if the rock or the mud is already saturated, if it is full of water or the rock is impermeable, then that will just run off into the nearest river or stream or lake or reservoir. All of it ending up at some point in a large collection of water, whether that is in the sea again, or whether that's in a reservoir, or whether that's in a lake. Some of that water will get taken up by plants and used in photosynthesis. It will also come out of plants in a process of transpiration, and then go up, and then the cycle can start all over again. Microorganisms are part of the system of biotics and abiotic factors that help break down old things, for example, old food, so that the components can be recycled back through the system. There are a wide range of different types of pollution, whether it's air pollution from smog, water pollution where oil or rubbish is getting into the water, um, or plastic pollution where we're just leaving rubbish all over the place. And this could have a dramatic impact on the plants and animals that live there. If we're changing the chemistry of the water that they're living in, if you're pumping in nitrates or fertiliser, or if you're pumping in too much oil, the fish and the plants are going to struggle to survive. With plastic, these are being eaten by animals and the chemicals in there are moving up the food chain. And air pollution is having a massive effect on the animals, not just the breathing, but whether they can, their ability to camouflage. There are a number of gases that contribute to global warming. We have carbon dioxide, water, and methane being the main ones. And global warming might be a slightly confusing term because not everywhere is getting hotter. Some places are getting colder, some places are getting drier, some places are getting windier. This is climate change going on. So while Australia may be having its hottest Christmas ever, we could be having our coldest Christmas ever here in the UK. And this is all due to global warming or climate change. This is going to have a massive impact on animals, predominantly on their habitat and their food sources. Polar bears live on ice caps, they hunt, they fish, and then they need to go and rest on floating blocks of ice. If the poles are getting warmer and the ice isn't there, then it's going to melt. Polar bears, after a long time fishing, won't have anywhere to rest and are at significant risk of drowning. Habitats are also spreading. For example, as the top of a mountain warms up, mosquitoes can move further up the mountain changing the location of where plants can grow, where animals can live. If a region is too hot or too cold, food may not grow there anymore, the plants or the animals that another animal survives on, which is going to leave a species vulnerable if their food source has been wiped out. If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there, randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered. You start at a point, take a line, and then take measurements at every single point along that line. This could be, say, from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. Stasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And to keep your body functioning properly, we need to control our blood glucose levels, our water levels, and our temperature. The brain is the control centre, and that's going to be sending signals um, to various parts of the body. For example, to the pancreas, which is responsible for producing insulin. Sectors muscles are going to do things like moving, for example, shivering. And then glands are going to be responsible for the production of other hormones. Mitosis will lead to two identical daughter cells, whereas meiosis will lead to four different daughter cells. You can remember mitosis goes to T because it has a T in it. Mitosis is used for things like growth or repair, whereas meiosis is used for sexual reproduction. So these are going to be gametes. In mitosis we are going to end up with diploid cells and in meiosis we are going to end up with haploid cells. Haploid cells having half the number of DNA as the original cell. 
In meiosis, we are going to have two divisions. So our chromosomes will line up, they will sort themselves down the middle, there will be a little bit of crossing over going on. So they will swap chunks of their chromosome to increase the genetic diversity. They will divide into two, then they will line up and divide into two again. And you'll notice that each of the cells have half the number of DNA as the parent cell. Paul Linnaeus developed taxonomy, which is the study of grouping living things together. We can see on our evolutionary tree here that some things are very closely grouped together and to get to other things you actually have to go quite a long distance. He develops a naming system where we have each organism has a two-part Latin name and this will tell us how closely related they are. It's a bit like them having a first name and a second name, a genus and then a species. The genus will be the wide overarching type of thing and then the species will be exactly what thing it is. With each new development in biology, with each new development in genetics, we understand more and more about classifications. So our taxonomy and our evolutionary tree is evolving all the time. The three domain system divides everything in life into three groups, eukaryotes, bacteria and archaea. Eukaryotes are things that have nuclei. An ecosystem are the animals, plants, everything living within a certain area. The community are the plants and animals that live there. And they're all dependent upon one another. They cannot survive without each other. For example, the animals eat the plants. They can't survive without doing that. And the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds. To survive and reproduce, a species needs food, water, air, and sometimes, but not always, a mate. Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors such as light intensity, temperature, water levels, pH, iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels. Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen.